Well, Jane, welcome to the MindMate podcast. Hi, Tom. Good to be here. <laughs> where Where are you actually in, in, in the world right now? I am in Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Sense. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it looks very, it looks very nice. We're in the middle of winter down here, so it looks very nice. I'm very jealous of you right now, sitting with a coffee outside. <laughs> Right. My coffee's right here. Yeah, actually. Yeah. You're in the winter. I forgot about that. Yep. Yep. Just, yep. Nice and cold. We just had a heat wave yesterday, but today it's really lovely. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. As I said, I'm, I'm very jealous. It's one of those things. Um, cool. So Jane, you and I have had a good chance to chat a little bit previously in the past couple of weeks, but um, for everyone listening and, and watching, um, could you give us just a brief rundown of, of who you are and, and what you do? Oh boy. Okay. Well, um, I'm a, uh, I was a psychotherapist. I really don't call myself that anymore. Um, more of a soul guide kind of stepped out of the whole system, but I worked uh, most of my life in the, in the area of healing. So healing first myself and then, and getting all this good training so that I could also work with others and heal others. And so spe- basically I specialize in working with trauma uh, from a spiritual point of view. So I tend to be, so, I, so I'm kind of leaving the, the, the container of the therapist mode, although that's where I've lived most of my life. And um, I've always done the work spiritually, uh, but I'm finding that there's, so there's just too many constraints as a therapist. So I like the freedom. I calling myself a soul guide at the moment. That's, mm. what I, that's awesome help i like to help people find their the true essence of their soul seed like who they are who they really are in the world if you were to take away all the conditioning all the junk we've grown up with and we just find out like why we're here what we're supposed to be doing that's what i love to do the most and i work a lot with people who've been early developmental trauma uh, because there's so much um, richness that's such a catalyst for uh, growth, personal growth. So people are hungry for, you know, it's like when we've been through a difficult time, people are hungry. They want change, as I was. So they're out looking for anything that they can find. So that's a great, that's a, a great people especially if they're oriented. So trauma with spirituality is sort of my little niche. Yeah, yeah. So how do those two correlate to one another, trauma and and spirituality? Um, I think when we've been traumatized when we're very, very young, there's just a longing, like a deep, deep longing that propels us for healing. And in the process of healing, we can't really heal or become whole without a more spiritual perspective because the healing, otherwise, the heal, it's not about fixing. So we can't fix what's wrong, although we start out thinking we can. So we start out thinking we want to fix what's wrong. And then as we get older and we keep going through the process, we discover that there's more to life that actually the issue itself the problem itself, the suffering itself was the catalyst mm-hmm. to find deeper meaning and deeper purpose. Mm-hmm. And, and um, what does trauma do then? So I can sort of imagine like to use your framing, like if it's soul guidance, you can also almost imagine a situation where, you know, someone's like walking down a path and something terrible happens and it's almost like an aspect of the soul is split um, and, and it's almost like, is your work kind of like going back in and, and reclaiming that part of themselves or how, how does, how does that yeah. work come into it? Yeah. That's a really great way to say it, Tom. Very good. So oh, good. <laughs> For doing my research. <laughs> right. You know that. Um, so yeah, I work from the perspective of both internal family systems. So I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, and also from what one would call soul, soul retrieval. So basically, and there's a, they're a little bit differently because it depends on how far back you're going or what you're actually reaching into, right? So, but in internal family systems, for example, when we're growing up with trauma, it's not safe to be in the world. 
so we develop certain defense mechanisms and um, we put into place called, which in internal family systems, they call protectors. So these protectors are in place and we grow up, and rightly so, because the little vulnerable, vulnerable parts of ourselves don't feel safe to be here. Mm. So we develop, and then we develop a, a picture or an image of ourselves or a persona that is actually isn't who we are, but it's the protectors, right? And then as we grow and as we get stronger and more resourced and have more experience in life, we can begin to, that's where the spiritual part comes in, as we begin to have a more sense of um, something deeper, like more connected mm. to the heart, right? Then we can begin to let go of those protectors. But we really can't let go of those protectors um, while we're too young or, or, t- or still too vulnerable because we don't have enough internal resources to do that. And then, but really what we're looking for is those, those parts of ourselves that we hid away, which were the exiles, and we need to retrieve those parts. So that would be, you know, in modern psychology would be more not necessarily viewed as soul retrieval, but would be definitely renegotiating or reintegrating parts of ourselves that we left behind that weren't safe to have when we were younger. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, yeah, reintegrating the exiles that we've put into the shadow aspects of ourself. Mm-hmm. Um, it gets really interesting, though, when we start working with what I call when we start working on a more of a soul level. And that, prob- that happens usually maybe later. When maybe there's enough of the recovering of the exiles and enough letting down of the protectors and we can begin to go into something that's bigger and more broad than just this lifetime because this lifetime is really constructed around certain conditions that the soul has put into place. But the soul has existed in time um, before and will continue to exist afterwards. So it gets really, really interesting from my point of view when we start looking into who, is, who am I really beyond the conditioned aspects of this life or this body or this what I thought I was. You know, if it's like, where do you stop asking that question? You know, we let go of false selves first. And then once we do that, we start wondering, well, now who am I? really right so it doesn't like where do you stop asking that question mm. and if you keep asking that question it keeps going deeper and deeper and you know, of course we're we're pure spirit so we're source but then what about our individualized aspect of source so that's where it gets into the aspect of the soul and then the soul you know it's like it's the aspect of spirit that comes in 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 a trajectory um, of more than one lifetime, of many lifetimes. And that would be what I would call more of the soul retrieval parts, when, especially when we're looking to retrieve parts of ourselves that aren't even in this lifetime yet. They never made it to this life. <laughs> yeah. they, they were too traumatized. They were left behind in some other galaxy somewhere. So there's that um, kind of work. And that's a really exciting work as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think what I love about it as well is that um, never stop asking. I think your point's really valid. You know, when we we often think, you know, growing up or whatever, that we are, you know, we are who we are. But your point is like, well, you have become that way based upon certain internal and external forces. And then when you retrieve um, greater truths, then you can start to ask broader questions. Well, if that wasn't who I was, and if that wasn't who I am in in my entirety, then who the F am I, you know? And I mean, have you ventured down that path? Like how deep does that question go? Oh yeah. I've been venturing down that path, not only with myself, but with others as well. It goes pretty deep. I'm sure I'm I'm not at the end of it yet. Yeah. God. because most spiritual quests are looking for the unity, you know, the unity consciousness, um, mm. which one call, can call this the source consciousness or the, the all that is, the oneness that we all are, right, that underlies all of these different forms. But um, 
to me, that was never enough because that didn't explain how did I get to be living this particular form of me here, right? If I'm mm. just source, why don't I just dis dissolve into the, the ethers of oneness? And so mm. there's got to be more. There's got to be more sense of boundary or more sense of something that defines me as separate from you, right? Mm -hmm. So Tom is a person who's sitting there and of course you're source and i'm source but wait a minute you're different than me and like what <laughs> makes you different than me so and if it's not your persona and it's not your protectors it's not your ego then what is the essence of the quality of who you are versus who i am mm. so that's what i started really becoming fascinated by and about Wow. Wow. So yeah. Okay. I, I really am fascinated with that because, you know, you look at the Eastern traditions and the, and the philosophy and so much dedication has been, you know, you know, so they, they've written all these things about um, probing the depths of consciousness and going lower and lower and lower. And then I'm very similar to you. I, I didn't like it because I'm like, Oh, and then when you get to the bottom, we're all just one. And then it's like, well, but like, that's so simple. Like, like how can we, Oh, that's the answer. It's to me, that's so absolutist, you know? So, and I don't think I've any, I don't think I've heard anyone say, well, what's deeper than that. So um, what were some of the, you know, the gold mines that you found on that path? Well, the, the shift happened to me um, when I was, I was doing a personal psychedelic journey and I was, I was actually going into the journey for the purpose of, it's like, basically, like you said, what the F went wrong with my life. Like, mm. you know, I had done all of this work, psychological work. I mean, I was really functional. I was really functional. I, you know, had a house and a career and a relationship. So there was nothing that I had to fix anymore mm. that was wrong with me. But there was some way that I just wasn't understanding um, why I was here, who I was, and what was I here for, and where did I come from, and what. That's what I went into the journey to discover, and I got the answers. So mm -hmm. that was when it started to open up. And then when I got those answers, because I because it felt like I asked the right questions. Like I could never get those answers before because I didn't ask those questions. Mm. So it, before it was about how do I become more functional or how do I have a good relationship or how do I make more money or whatever it is like, you know, or what's my belonging in this world that had been answered to a certain extent, but there was this one level where it wasn't answered and I wanted to know more. And so that's when I started asking that question, like, who am I? Where did I come from? If I never felt like I really belonged here on earth, right? And I wasn't in the, the mainstream of the culture functioning like you're supposed to be doing, then who the heck was I? And so like I was asking and I got my answers. Um, that's when the doors just opened. And in that process, that's what was so interesting is it also opened me up to the discovery of capacities that I didn't know I had because all of those capacities were left behind um, and they weren't of that. They couldn't take them. Like I couldn't take them into this life. So I had to, those were the soul. Some of the soul parts that I started to rediscover that the actual soul as it travels through time, um, dimensions and other realms and other places and we can do all the psychological work we can do in this life and never retrieve those parts because they're not here in this lifetime they never came in so that's what became began to fascinate me because what actually happened mm. when i made that shift was i discovered parts of myself that I always had had an inkling I had, but I didn't know how to, I had no idea until they began to land. And when they began to land, there was an actual re, you know, recalibration, -cal so to speak, of who I am as a person in the world. So that became very real. It wasn't just a fantasy. The capacities mm -hmm. began to show up. Wow. And, and you mentioned before you were talking about, you know, helping people not only find um, themselves at a, at a deeper level, but 
find, I guess, more of a, an intrinsically meaningful path, like a, a calling or a purpose. I was wondering yeah. how that kind of stuff comes into um, the work you do, the work you do with yourself. Um, so were you always aware that you wanted to, to be a healer and then, and then how you can help people find that for themselves? Oh, no. I, I think it's like the path of the wounded healer, right? I was just right. trying to save myself. Right, right. Yeah, I've got a similar background. <laughs> yeah, so saving myself and, and falling into all the greatest of different teachings and spiritually as well as psychologically and somatically, so doing all the work on all the different levels. Mm. And little by little, healing myself, healing myself, and then the, at the same time, realizing that this was the only work that was really meaningful. So, of course, I would want to share it with others, and that's how that started to fall into place. And the other interesting thing I discovered was as I was healing myself, I was healing myself through helping others. That my capacity to be more present with myself, my capacity to be in my highest sense of who I was as a human being showed up in the service of others mm. um, so that because when I wasn't in the service of others that's what um, you, the conditioned responses and the negativity so like you know like in trauma one of the major symptoms of trauma is a very negative mind so a negative mind is a very severe inner critic Sarah Payton calls it the um, savage the savage DMN. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with her and that term that she uses, which is really wonderful? Um, so, Sarah, are you familiar with Sarah Payton's work? And I don't know Sarah Payton's work, but I, I, I like that terminology for it for sure. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty well, that, spot on. That comes from her. So she calls it the default mode network of the pe of people who are traumatized. Yes. So the default mode network is the part of the brain that holds the ego or the sense of identity. Mm. What is what science is finding out now, right? So mm. we default to it. So when we're not focused on our spiritual practice or we're not focused on an addiction when we're, or we're not focused on a creative project, we just lapse back into our default mode, our personality system, so to speak. People who've been traumatized have a very savage, she named it the savage DMN or the, the savage default mode. And so when we're dealing and grappling under the weight of that huge um, negativity, you know, we're looking for ways to get out of it. And of course, addictions are the most obvious ways we get out of, out of that negativity, right? Totally, totally. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, I think this is an area of the podcast that I really wanted to start moving into. That idea that you kind of touched on then was, what, what you find yourself doing to remove yourself from unbearable states of consciousness, which obviously will arise when you're just being in the present moment, that is that addictive, you know, um, personality or, or that savage that is trying to pull you away from actually all that we ever have and will have, which is the present moment. How does the therapy that you do um, come into it. So are you starting to, um, you know, gradually expose people to staying with whatever is arising in the present or how does it work? Well, that's what you're talking about is the basic process of mindfulness really. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I find that. So people come with, me. Uh, um, I, like I said, I work with, um, internal family system. So that's one way, because as soon as we're able to begin to recognize oh, this voice inside my head, that's criticizing me is not me. It's the critic, the inner critic, and that it can, I can actually separate myself from that. So we have to, we actually have to begin to learn to disidentify with the parts of ourselves that aren't the truth of who we are. Um, and then more and more people are using psychedelics these days. So more and more people are coming to me for help with preparing for those journeys and integration of those journeys. And that is, I try to prepare people for, well, what would it be like to live outside your default mode? <laughs> what would that feel like? You're going to do a journey, right? But what, what that could shatter the whole life you've built. 
because you all of a sudden you find out you're not who you thought you were. And now like, what are you going to do when you come out the other side of the journey and you walk into your life and now nothing's quite fit? Well, what's either going to happen is you're going to, is you're going to either default back to where you were because you want to get back into alignment with the reality that you've already created, which was built on the previous default mode. But then when that default mode gets rewired, there's a new reality that has to be created to match that default mode. And we either, we either step up to our, to the, the new identity we're creating, or we fall back and we fall back to the old. And that's typically what I see. So what I try to do when people come to me to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to do this healing of my life and I, and I'm going to do a journey and, um, I, the first thing I do is start preparing them for who they would be without that default mode so that they can begin experiencing that and preparing to put their life together in alignment with this new being that was wanting to be birthed, which is their true self, right? Their essence of who they are, but they don't yet have, they're not yet in contact with what that is. Because it's the case that, when we're so attached to the DMN, we're so attached to this identity that we can't even see that we actually could be someone else, you know, just by a process of behaving differently, just, just even thinking about what it would be like not to suffer is a, uh, an unfathomably difficult task for people. Uh, it, it was for me and I, I'm sure it was for you. So, so how, how do you start to, to do that with, with people? Well, it's step by step. Right. I mean, at least in my life it was, right? I'm sure yeah. in my life we don't, like, I mean, very few people leap, right? So it's, so we're carefully stepping um, forward and trying out new things. And it's like, first, there's this incredible sense of fear and terror about who am I without this old personality that I was or this old way of behaving in the world. Like, who am I? Mm. So very, very terrifying to be on that edge. And so there has to be a lot of safety and a lot of support and a lot of encouragement for taking that step out from that edge. And that's why I usually tell people this is, I mean, a lot of people come with the idea that they're going to do this miraculous psychedelic journey, right? And then yeah. everything will be pretty good. I mean, but yeah. really realistically, that's not the way it is and so it's just those journeys can really speed things up um but we're going to fall back probably most people do tend to like they go forward 10 steps and back five um so it's getting used to used to who that new person is and that new behavior that we're wanting to take on and and stepping into that and becoming that and making it safe to be that I mean, that's the key word I use all the time is safety. Mm. We have to have or externally. So, so we have two forms of safety. We have external safety, you know, whether it's like your friend or your partner or your house or whatever, or your money in the bank. A lot of people, that's their safety, right? <laughs> but we also have to be able to embody the safety. It's like in the body and feel that sense of safety and feel our feet on the ground. And when we've been traumatized, we don't have, many of us don't have that ground mm. in terms of being in our own bodies that way. Yeah, that's such a good point. And what are some ways to cultivate that internal safety? Because I think a lot of people would understand, oh, you know, because it's almost like that safety idea. It's, it's, it, it's keeping you, um, comfortable being who you are it's like these are my friends this is my money all of this stuff the these are external representations that i am this person and when you when you take on a psychedelic journey or any kind of you know deep work we're starting to rip apart and unpack those well maybe you're not this person or maybe maybe you are this person because that made that past event made you this person so and, I, and now I can see, sorry, I'm just thinking on my feet here. I'm just trying to take in everything you've been talking about, Jane, but you can see how that spirituality comes into it because the initial healing aspect is like that who you are right now is suffering and is in pain. Let's become someone else. And then the reflection after you've done that work, it's like, 
because you could shift people or you could shift identities, who are you really? And then you become identified with no identification. Have I got that right? Well, yes and no, but <laughs> I should have been listening more. <laughs> no, no, that's a pretty huge gap. Yes. I mean, to go from identification to no identification. So usually there's going to be a form of more positive identification. So like, for example, yep. I had an eating disorder for a number of years. So one of the ways I had to give up that enabled me to give the eating disorder up was I took on a more positive addiction, mm. which was that I would actually sit in front. Those were the old days and we had actually television, right? So I would yeah. actually sit in front of the television. The good old days, Jane. <laughs> the good old days and watched for hours because that was better than my eating disorder behavior. So that was a more positive, mm. that was one simple little step into a more positive sense of myself. But eventually I got to where I could let go of that and still retain, right, um, a positive sense. So it's like step by step into more positive versions of myself and finding mm. out, you know, and when they build up over time, then it's like you get to be two decades later and you get to look back and say, well, I did that and I was okay. Maybe I can take this step now. Mm. I was okay then. I could take another step now and I'll be okay. Mm. So we, but for, when we have an understanding or a realization that we're bigger than our fear, you know, we're bigger than our personality and we have a way, like whether it's through breath or visualization or some practice, we have a way to keep connecting with that biggerness of who we are. That's a huge safety resource that we can draw on all the time. And that's what I utilize all the time. Because then mm. forms can change, you know, relationships can change, addictions can change. Uh, we can lose a job and still know if we can fall back on that inner place of trust and faith that things always work out because there's something larger at work through my life that's a, a key resource yes yes and and where typically do you find that people because I, I imagine i'm sure just by how long you've doing this you would have had people that are atheistically minded you know seek help and have you ever had an experience where you know, someone's broken and starting to recognize that fear and anger and pain and, you know, just like their feet and their hands are aspects of themselves, but they're not truly who they are. And if you start to see them take on a more spiritual uh, position. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, and it's tricky sometimes because with people who don't have, who are more atheists, for example, who don't have an, an understanding of some kind of spiritual foundation or faith, then it's trickier to find, help them find that. So, so you, you, you can help them find it by listening to the language, like what words are they using. Um, but one of my favorite exercises is to have people review their life and notice how even in the bad events, things turned out. So like they, if they can go back and review their life and notice, for example, that there's actually a positive life force that's working through everything that's happened in their life, even the bad times, and they can actually go back and see it and follow that thread, something will open up. They'll be like, aha, oh, you're right. That thing was positive and it worked out even though it appeared to be terrible. <laughs> And there's your opening to spirituality. What's that positive force that's working through your life? And then people can find their own word for it. You know, maybe it's not God or spirit. You know, maybe they have another word that they use for that experience. Mm. But that's their, that's their hold on something else that's bigger mm. than that. What was your growth into spirituality? Like, were you always open-minded in that regard? Oh, or? God, no. I came from, a, like, a really closed, materialistic, un I would say unloving, I mean, unloving family. Not hostile, mm. it wasn't abusive, but I didn't really <clears throat> have a character. So for me, the mine happened from my... Um, first LSD experience. I actually, not my first, but I, you know, I was a child of the sixties. So we did yes. a lot of experimenting, right? I was going to ask. Yes. 
there were a lot of LSD experiences, but the biggest one was when we had a huge spiritual awakening. And after that, I didn't do any more for a long time because I wow. had found what I was looking for. But the real shift happened. So that was a, quote, drug experience, right? But that told me that there was something maybe out there, but my mind could still put it away as drug. So what Yes, we- rationalize. Right. But so then it was a number of years later when I was, I actually was on the subway in New York City and I was sitting there and all of a sudden out of the blue, just like this love energy just came and, and bliss. I was like given this grace of God right then, right in the middle of, of, of um, rush hour, you know, subway traffic. Wow. rush hour subway in the subway in New York City and everything just turned into this incredibly beautiful loving experience so I, that was my turning point that was my my moment of grace and that wow. moment was when I decided I'm going to heal my life and I'm going to heal it spiritually mm. so that's what it did it set me on a spiritual path wow because I, I just think that you know, even if you are doing all this healing work and I'm probably biased because I take on very, very similar opinions and viewpoints to you. That's one of the reasons why I want to get you on the show. I've listened to you speak and I've had a look at your work and it's brilliant. You know, that's why I wanted you on. Um, I just feel, I can't seem to get around my own bias. You know, let's just say someone is, is anxious and they go and speak to a psychotherapist and they use gradual, you know, exposure therapy or whatever it is, and they can combat their fears and all that sort of stuff. There is still that more, more, that more transcendent feeling of separation. It's like, okay, I've worked on myself, but you know, what am I here to do? Like, who am I? Am I like, am I just supposed to do this and then die? Like it's a very um, separate isolated kind of feeling you know yeah that's the plague and illness of the um industrialized urbanized culture that's what we're all dealing with and there's this deep longing inside of all of us to find out to reconnect to reconnect with each other to reconnect with the earth to reconnect with our soul to reconnect with the cosmos and and to know that we're part of something um, that we have a vital meaning for mm. being there. And that's what some, you know, that's what the beautiful rituals and ceremonies that many in indigenous cultures cultivated um, as part of their as part of their, their cultures that were connected to the earth and connected to the ancestors. And people were named, given names, right, based on um, their sole purpose. Because the shaman of the village or the elder of the village could actually tune in and communicate with that soul and know. And the name was known. That person was known. Their soul essence was known. So that's my passion. My passion is helping (laughs) each person one at a time get back to that place but Mm. it's not an easy journey and it's painful because each step of the way we um are aware of what we've lost so there's a lot of we'd have to have the capacity to experience loss and grief for what has been missing but if we don't do it we're never going to get there you know i think that that point there is one of the reasons why i really wanted to speak with you jane is because you hear in this, in this day and age, um, there's a lot of people out there that are doing, um, you know, similar work. And when I say similar work, I mean, they're under the guise of the same kind of stuff, you know, healing work and all this sort of stuff. There's a lot of work around finding your passion and being all you can be. And, and I think that's brilliant. I think it's a step in the right direction from just working a typical nine to five. But I remember you saying something on a podcast I was listening to. It wasn't this, but it was on the lines of, um, you know, if we are really going to grow into that love energy, I mean, love is, is totally, totally vulnerable. So there's a, there's a lot of pain and, and growth there and, and you've got to work through all the shame and all the barriers and stuff to remain open in, in that space. Um, mm. And I, I, I can't, and I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what you said, but it was something like that. It was, I took, 
I took that lesson from it. And what it told me was that it's almost like, it's almost like you can see why people just stay comfortable because like to really live from a profound sense of being, it's really, really scary. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, we have to face, um, well, the devastation, you know, of, of our disconnection. Mm. And what that's done to us, not just in our lifetime, but in our ancestry. It's a, it's a huge, I don't know whether you're familiar, but there's a huge wave now that's focused on more of collective healing because there's so much, right, that humanity is, there's so much upheaval now mm. with the pandemic and people are really being opened up and torn apart and um, forced to look at themselves. And in the process mm. of doing that, it's looking at the collective history Yes, our culture and the pain that not only that we've experienced as a result of being disconnected, but that we've inflicted on others. Yes, so it's a very very painful process to go through that, and I don't think we cannot do it alone. That's mm. why we have um, these movements now that are that are about coming together, healing and of the healing that each of us has to go through. Like in my earlier days, the healing was so personal. Mm. I was just doing it by myself, part of the separation. And that's beginning to come to an end. Mm. People are now beginning to see that we can't really do it ourselves. Mm. We mm. need each other. Mm. Totally. Even if it's just another shoulder to cry on, that we're all in this together. Well, that, that was, um, you know, this is one of Carl Jung's points is that, you know, the, the ego and identity, there are also socially or social identities. And I think if we are going to, you know, come together as a union, we have to recognize to your point that history has consequences and the vast devastation that, you know, um, you know, indigenous people, black people have had to deal with. And, you know, we're now kind of transcending past, identities you know hopefully dispensing with you know what was what was tyrannical and, and and we're in this interesting time of change and everyone has an opinion and but but ultimately i think as the evolution of this kind of social consciousness consciousness occurs i, I think it is which it's heading into a good place you know oh definitely I mean, we have to everything has to fall apart before it can reconfigure <laughs> Right. <laughs> yes yes exactly right we can't escape that so each of us has to go through that personally and then we have to do that, go through that as a as a society mm. and then there are forces that are wanting to keep it um the way it was and so there's like a tenacious grip that's going to be a counter to that falling apart um but it ultimately at some point there has to be a collapse in order to be the rebirth. Totally. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And so you said before that um, people come to you for guidance um, when they partake on, on psychedelic journeys is, is some of the guides I've looked into, you know, what maps are doing and I'm really excited about, you know, the whole, that whole area that's coming out in, in, in the U S you know, looking into this idea, there was, and you said you were a child of the sixties. So you probably would have seen a lot of that squashed when you were growing up, you know, and you're like, yeah, we were, we're onto something. We we're onto something guys. So that must be really exciting for you. Oh yeah. Well, it's a new revolutionary time that's happening. So sure. But I was too out of it to really recognize what was happening back then. Sure. You know? So, um, you know, I was just in the trance. The word I call it is I was just in the trance myself. I was like, well, if they say drugs are bad, they must be bad, even though they weren't bad for me. But <laughs> True. About it, but <laughs> yeah, so it is a very exciting time with the research. It's just sad that it has to go through such bureaucracy and stuff to get back on board. And thank goodness there's so many underground people doing it so that they're not waiting so that people can actually get help from the people who are underground doing that work. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you know, I wouldn't have been 
I wouldn't have the integration practice that I have in the prep practice. So people are finding people to work with and um, it's making, it's beginning to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And then also seeing that, you know, from those journeys that you can actually cultivate greater awareness, um, not only using psychedelics, they, they really open a heap of doors when you do them and you're like, Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. I am not who I thought I was, but then you can, you can start to see spiritual tests manifest everywhere, whether it's, um, relationships, breath work, like you mentioned before, um, just trying to take more of a, a, um, a separate perspective detaching from the thoughts and things. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, again, as I said, that's a process. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, psychedelics are not going to, I find that the people who have been engaged, okay, so it's very interesting. What I see is that people come to this at totally different places on their journey, on their soul's journey, right? And it's, there's nothing more obvious than, so you could be sitting in therapy, right? Just regular therapy, right? With, you know, person A and person B. And you can see how person A might take to something and person B, maybe not so much, right? There's not that much of a contrast. But when you're actually working with people who are actually going on these very deep dive journeys, and then I am witnessing how person A really moves with something and person yeah. B just goes way back and collapses back, if not even regresses even further back, you have to start wondering like, what is that about? Mm-hmm. So I've just noticed that there, it's so that everybody is at a very, again, it's the soul trajectory. Mm-hmm. It's like where we are on the path of our own soul's journey that determines what we take to and what we don't take to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some people are, have been doing lots of work for many years and they are just able to take what comes and run with it and utilize it and, cultivate it and assimilate it and grow from it and other people have an experience and then it's like a shock and then they just close back up and run back run away so there's it's, there's no guarantees so that's where my work becomes very important because I mm. it's foresee and how yes. can I prepare this person to get the most from this journey that they're about to do I, I re- I really love that because we put all, put all, seem to pull all our eggs in, in, in the psychedelic basket, thinking that the, the experience alone is going to give me everything I need. But as you say, it's just like so much of it is about integrating it, you know, and, and using it and, and, and reminding yourself that what, you know, yeah, it, it's just, it, it's almost like that's one half of it, but then you've still got work to do, which is why we're in a body so that we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> so we can actually get to it. I know for myself, there's many times I wished I wasn't in a body, but here I am, right? So that's where the work is. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm very happy uh, you're in the body, Jane, so that we can talk um, at least through the mouth. <laughs> Seems to work well. <laughs> <laughs> that's really um, funny. Jane, I, we, I know you've got to get out of here soon. I, I'd love to have you on the show for round two. I think we could go a lot deeper um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. But anything that you're working on now, um, some, some things that are coming up for you or where, where, can, where can you direct the listeners? Um, you mean in terms of like just checking what I've got going out? I yeah. mean, okay, they can just go, people can go to my website. It's janelatimer.com. That's it. You can go in there and see what's up. It's all there. L A T I M E R. Yeah. So J A N E L A T I M E R. And I'd love to do a round two, Tom. There's a lot more. We just barely touched the surface. Oh yes. We barely have touched the surface, my friend. I know it'll be good. It'll be good. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll email in a, in a, in a couple of months and we'll, we'll make it happen. It'll be good. Okay. Sounds great. Cool. Right. Jane, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me on your podcast do you call it a show on the show yeah i kind of move between the two podcast or show i'm not too attached to the name so <laughs> <laughs> okay great well. cool so thanks All jane right. thanks guys bye